Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, Dairy Lab 2016 and Beyond, Lowest Operating Costs, Highest Repeatability, and Eliminate Sample Preparation. This event brought to you by Dairy Foods is sponsored by Bruker. I'm your moderator, Adam Thomas, with Dairy Foods. Thanks for joining us. Today's pre presenters are from Bruker and are uh, Dean Roberts, the Director of NIR and Process Technologies North, uh, in North America, and Ralph Hewitt, the Key Accounts Manager in North America. Dean has over 30 years experience in FTIR and NIR applications in food, beverage, chemical, and pharmaceutical industries. Ralph Hewitt has 18 years of experience in manufacturing, quality control, and IR, NIR, and Raymond spect spectroscopy. Ralph's industrial experience came from being both a quality control manager and production superintendent in food plants with some of the largest companies in the world. Before we begin the presentation, I want to provide you with a few housekeeping items. On the right side of your screen, you will see a taskbar. Each icon on the taskbar is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. If you are unsure about what an icon does, hover over the icon with your mouse and a box will pop up that tells you the function. Please take our survey following the webinar by clicking on the survey icon in the taskbar. Next to the slides window, there's a blank questions box that allows you to type a question in the box and hit the submit button to send it to us. Later in the live program, our presenters will address as many questions as possible. Today's event is being recorded and archived on www.dairyfoods.com. All registered participants will receive an email within one to two business days that has a link to view the recording of the event. And without further ado, I'm excited to turn it over to today's first presenter, Dean Roberts. Dean? Thank you, Adam. The use of spectroscopic analyzers for analyzing milk goes back to the pre-1970s. Um, initially, samples were run by the traditional wet chemistry techniques being Mojanier, Keldahl for fat, or Mojanier for fat, Keldahl for protein determination, loss on drying, and other methods for determining lack and the uh, percent solids in the milk. The first generation of instruments that would use spectroscopic techniques for analyzing milk were optical filter instruments. And they were really limited to the analysis of whey samples and milk samples. Um, somewhere between the 70s and 90s, if you look at the literature, you'll see a lot of uh, papers that were published trying to use dispersive infrared spectrometers to quantitate the protein, fat, lactose and total solids in the milk. And those efforts were marginally successful, mainly not having the precision and accuracy necessary to meet the requirements of plants and what the wet chemistry methods were able to support. And this is mostly due to the fact that scans took a long time to complete. The wavelength accuracy of the instruments wasn't very good. And the uh, signal to noise ratio wasn't sufficient to be able to support the precision and accuracy requirements. The advent of FTIR spectrometers really constituted a revolution in infrared spectroscopy, making the scans much faster, featuring excellent wavelength accuracy and signal to noise ratio. And that really allowed people to start getting accuracy and precision that was competitive with the wet chemistry methods for analyzing fluid milk products. Still, you needed to have different types of instruments to be able to measure solids, milk powders, cultured products, and so forth, which required the use of other uh, dedicated uh, near-infrared spectrometers. So to analyze the complete flow of products in a dairy processing facility, you really needed a minimum of two instruments, sometimes even three. The next generation, which we're going to talk about today, is the advent of FTNIR spectrometers operating in the near-infrared spectral region, but taking advantage of the FT technology that made infrared spectroscopy in the, use of, in the analysis of fluid dairy products a routine technology. And modern near-infrared spectrometers using the FT capability are capable of switching measurement channels to optical systems that are dedicated to the measurement of solids or the measurement of liquids. 
So looking at the first generation analyzers, mainly optical filters, and what that means is an optical filter would filter out wavelengths specific to um, protein or fat or lactose and use those signals, converting to an electrical signal, to correlate to the concentration. Very straightforward instruments, but they were pretty large, quite bulky, and um, didn't really have the performance and long-term stability to be able to be routinely used in most uh, dairy plants. Uh, subject to significant drift, so you always had to run samples with known values to be able to bias the calibrations to give the correct answers. The second generation instruments using the FTIR technology were much better, and actually they work quite well for liquid systems where you have low viscosity and you can really pump the samples through the transmission flow cells without stratifying the sample or plugging it up. Um, and one of the features of an FTIR spectrometer in measuring fluid milk samples is that the uh, repeatability and the accuracy is often equal to or superior to the standard error of the reference methods, which means that you're not sacrificing anything in terms of using an FTIR relative to the wet chemistry methods to determine the constituent values of milk products. Um, the one downside of the FTIR is that because of the nature of the spectra and the absorbances in the infrared, you have to use very thin path length cells that will plug up and have a lot of back pressure when you're trying to run high viscosity samples like creams or ice cream premixes. Now, the advantages of Fourier transform spectroscopy, uh, from a spectroscopy standpoint, break down into three different areas. The Felgen advantage is the multiplex advantage, meaning that all wavelengths are simultaneously measured, so you get faster measurements. And the Jacquinot advantage is the fact that there are no slits to restrict the energy reaching the detector, which gives you a higher signal-to-noise ratio. And it turns out that in analyzing milk and cream and ice cream premix, Samples, that higher throughput is a significant reason why you're able to do these measurements with an FTIR, but also with an FTNIR, and that explains why we're able to use an FTNIR to measure these samples, whereas other attempts with just regular near-infrared spectrometers have failed. And then the final advantage is called the CONS advantage, which is a wavelength precision advantage meaning that we use a helium neon laser internally in the instrument to calibrate the wavelength on the x-axis of the instrument. And this is the fundamental reason why we were able to transfer calibrations from one instrument to the next without having to readjust the calibrations with data from the target instruments. And one thing that's important to realize is that the FT advantages that were the reason that you were able to use FTIR spectrometers in fluid milk analysis is exactly applicable to the FTNIR region of the spectrum that we're using today. So looking at the next generation in dairy analysis, the Simply One FTNIR by Brooker is composed of a liquid sampling module and Brooker's MPA spectrometer. Um, and it can measure liquids, it can measure cultured and thickened products, and measure solid samples all on one instrument, switchable under computer control. There's no need for an operator to have to go change out modules or uh, reconfigure the instrument when switching from liquid products to solids or cultured products or cheeses. So looking at the uh, Simply One system, what you see on the right is the MPA spectrometer. And on the top, you see a rotating dish that has uh, a graded cheese sample in there, which is an integrating sphere that is used to measure the samples. And then just to the left of that is the transmission compartment, which is used for measuring the liquid samples. On the left-hand side of the spectrometer, you see the liquid sampling module. And the fact that you can run both liquids and solids on one instrument with a small footprint in the laboratory with no sample preparation means that you're going to get much better precision and accuracy on the methods that you're using on that spectrometer. And you're going to be able to get a much quicker return on investment 
um, for small to mid-sized processors where it may be difficult to realize an acceptable return on investment for a single instrument that does only liquids or a single instrument that does only solids, let alone a system that will do both. So when we look at the Simply One near-infrared spectrometer, we uh, can pretty much draw a line um, right down the middle there where we have the uh, uh, liquids and the solids. So to the right of that line, we see the solids in the integrating sphere. Sampling methods can include just a piece of uh, uh, plastic where you set the sample on top, or you could have a rotating dish with either a polystyrene Petri dish or a glass Petri dish. And then to the left of that line, you see where the uh, uh, liquid cell is placed for analysis of uh, whey, milk, uh, creams, ice cream premixes, and so forth. When we look at the liquid sampling module, we've got a sample uptake tube with level detection. And the level detector switch serves two purposes. First of all, it keeps you from pumping air into the system if you run out of sample. But secondly, when the system does an automatic clean, it prevents the cleaning solution from back flushing into the sample and destroying your sample. The second part is the homogenizer, which is necessary for processing of raw milk. Uh, the homogenizer is a small uh, valve that pumps the sample through at high pressure to chop up the fat globules to make them much smaller and give you a more homogeneous presentation of the liquid. And then finally, there's a peristaltic pump, which is used for samples that don't need homogenization. Typically, only raw milk samples or condensed whole milk samples, things that have not had the, uh, the fat chopped up and made into smaller particles, um, the peristaltic pump can be used just to present those samples without uh, running them through the homogenizer. And the advantage of that is that the homogenizer valve does wear over time. And if you don't have to homogenize samples by just using the peristaltic pump, you will be able to um, um, extend the operating length of the homogenizer quite a bit. There's your temperature controlled one millimeter transmission cuvette. And there's the integrating sphere for solids, powders, and cultured products. Now, the difference between the Simply One FTNIR system and other systems lies in three areas. The first area is the flow cell. And compared with an FTIR spectrometer, the cell in the near-infrared is a quartz cell that doesn't have any wear over time. So it's not necessary to go in and periodically bias calibrations to account for changes in the path length of a calcium fluoride cell used for the FTIR. And the one millimeter path length gives you much less resistance to pumping more viscous samples. So you can do everything from whey to heavy cream, chocolate milk, ice cream premix, eggnog, without having to dilute the sample. And then finally, because of the way the measurement's made, there's no zero solution that is required to be able to take the background measurements. The second difference is the uh, liquid sampling module where the homogenizer is only used for raw milk, as I mentioned previously. The peristaltic pump is used to deliver all other liquid samples. So it's not necessary to homogenize cream samples or ice cream premix, eggnog. And in most cases, whey samples don't have to be homogenized either if the, the fat hasn't uh, separated out of the whey. Um, inside of the LSM is a, a liquid a loop for stabilizing the temperature of liquid samples. And finally, the sample level detect prevents air entry into the system and then prevents uh, back flush into a sample if a sample is in place when a clean cycle is used. And then finally, the spectrometer is based on the Brooker MPA, which is the world's best-selling FTNIR spectrometer. There's over 3,000 of them installed in the field um, in all areas of uh, industry, pharmaceutical, chemical production, oil and gas, and food and feed applications. Um, it's the highest performance spectrometer that you can get and uses a dedical optical system for each one of the types of samples that you would be measuring. 
the reliability is outstanding and it has the highest uptime of any of the near infrared spectrometers on the market. Now when you look at the Simply One FT on IR versus other techniques, the difference becomes pretty clear. If you look in the yellow band along the top and look at the sample types that can be measured on one instrument, you see that across the board you can measure milk, high viscosity samples, low viscosity samples, cultured products, uh, cheese, milk powders, pretty much anything that you would encounter in a uh, dairy processing facility. When you look at FTIR, you're really limited to just the liquid samples and some of those samples may have to be diluted to avoid problems in trying to pump them through a narrow path length cell. When we go look down at the uh, scanning dispersive and diode array near infrareds, they're really kind of limited to the solids, maybe some applications for cultured products. Near infrared transmission is more often used for the cultured products and the cheese samples. And then when you look at microwave for doing moisture analysis and time domain near infrared or uh, NMR for looking at the fat samples, you see that the numbers of samples that can be addressed using those techniques is even further restricted. Now one of the features of uh, the near infrared is that we're dealing with shorter wavelengths in the spectrum. And looking at the spectrum in red of uh, just raw milk, you see that the baseline is relatively flat. The blue spectrum is the homogenized milk sample. And the reason that the baseline on the left-hand side of the uh, curve increases is because the smaller fat particles that are produced by homogenization cause scattering of the near-infrared beam. And one of the advantages of this is we can actually use this as a metric to be able to tell whether our homogenizer needs to be replaced or not. And you could actually use the spectrometer without the homogenizer to determine how well your process homogenization is working in terms of calibrating for the fat droplet size in your milk products. So if we look at the performance of the Simply One system, you can see that um, uh, we're looking at just a few different types of samples, raw milk, condensed skim, light and heavy creams, and the whey samples. And the calibrations that were put together were actually made using samples obtained all over the world with a heavy dose of samples from DQCI's Instrument Calibration Standards Program. So for the fat on raw milk, we're ranging from uh, 0.05 to 5.61. Actually, we've now got some samples that are up above 6% uh, butterfat concentration. And the coefficient of variation is at about 0.9%. Looking at the uh, uh, total nitrogen protein of uh, raw milk, we're at 0.52, and then true protein at 0.72, total solids 0.55, and you can read the rest of them off for yourself. One thing that's of interest is looking at the heavy cream and the light cream you see that the coefficient of variation for um, the, the fat and the protein are also very good. So you can get excellent repeatability on those types of samples. When we run a single sample that has uh, replicate measurements um, allowed, where we may take five replicate measurements on the same sample, typically what we find for repeatability is that for raw milk and cream samples, we're in the area of about 0.005 to 0.007 percent standard deviation in the, um, in the measurements. So very, very repeatable from sample to sample. Now in terms of the calibrations, um, I mentioned that we've put these together so that we can um, include samples from all over the world. Brooker is a multinational company with offices in every major country on the planet. And by combining these different samples, we're able to represent all of the sources of variation that you would have in a milk sample. So doing the calibration, we would come up with a cross-validation that would show you how well the calibration is able to predict the samples that are in the calibration. But then doing an external validation 
is used to see how well it actually predicts the concentration of samples that are not in the calibration, which is what we're looking at here. So if we look at the external validation where we've taken a number of samples that are not included in the calibration and run them against that calibration, we see that we have an R squared of 99.99 and the root mean squared error of about uh, 0 0.026. And the RPD value is a measure of the robustness of the calibration. And the RPD value is the standard deviation of the reference values in the concentration divided by the standard error of prediction. So we see here that on the statistics down on the bottom, the bias is 0.0014, thereabouts correlation four nines, and the slope is at one. So we have a very good, robust calibration. When we look at protein in the raw milk, we see the same thing, really. Uh, the root mean squared error is about 0 0.022. RPD is a little bit lower at 11.4, and that's really driven by the narrower range of the protein values that we're looking at. And again, the bias is at 0 0.001, and um, the RPD at 11.4 is still in an area that gives you very good reliability in the calibration itself. So looking at solid samples, um, we picked out just a few of these uh, to be representative. Um, looking at the milk powder calibration, we see that the protein has a CV of 1.4, fat of about uh, 8.5, and this is non-fat dry milk, so the fat values are really quite low. Um, moisture. Uh, CV of 3.3%, lactose 1.25, and you see also the other types of samples that we can run on this instrument. Again, these are measured using uh, either glass or polystyrene petri dishes, or in the case of butter, you can just put it on a piece of saran wrap on top of the instrument and run it as is. Uh, it's very flexible in being able to switch back and forth between the liquids and the solid samples. So looking at the validation summary that we have for milk, this is the latest validation data off of the instruments that we've been running at a few locations in North America. And these validations were done using BQCI uh, instrument calibration standards. So looking at the number of samples for uh, the raw milk and the raw low fats, we've got about 100 samples in the validation study, minimum fat value of 0.03 and up to 3.15 for protein. Um, and fat up to 5.5, uh, and um, the um, bias is actually the bias on the external validation. You see there's essentially zero bias throughout the entire thing. And this is one of the benefits of the FPNIR technology in that having to bias calibrations to compensate for instrument drift is something that is just non-existent. So that means that you can cut down on the number of um, calibration standards that you would have to purchase over the lifetime of the instrument to verify that the instrument is giving you accurate readings over the course of the use of that instrument. Looking at the root mean squared error of prediction, uh, 0.031 on fat, 0.026 on protein, 0.022 on true protein, and so forth, are very, very close to the accuracy of the reference methods. And of course, any spectroscopic method like FTIR or near-infrared are secondary methods that must be calibrated using the primary method, which means that they can never be more accurate, but oftentimes they are much more precise. And then finally, looking at the relative standard deviation, this is the average for all samples, including low-fat and skim milk samples. So the um, average relative standard deviation for fat over the range of 0 to 5.5% uh, uh, fat was 1.63. And again, the uh, relative standard deviation is the standard deviation divided by the average value. So when you're running uh, uh, skim samples and very low fat samples, the RSD tends to climb up, which drives that number a little bit higher than one would get for just analyzing raw milk. Uh, typically, 
the standard deviation that we get in replicate measurements on raw milk is around 0.005 to 0 0.007 um, percent of the, the value. Here's a cross-validation of uh, protein in milk powder. Now, this is the calibration itself. So we see that uh, the R squared, again, is uh, 0.9982 with a root mean squared error of 3.46. And again, uh, the, uh, the slope is right around 1, and the RPD value of about 23.7, which um, is indicative of a very, very robust calibration. And then the external validation, again, is running samples that were not part of the calibration set. And the key here is that the uh, uh, root mean squared error of 3.344 is very similar to the uh, cross-validation error, indicating that we've got a predictive model that performs equally well on the calibration set as it does on the external validation samples. So in terms of return on investment, if you're looking to justify the purchase of an analyzer to go into a laboratory, it really depends on how much you can do with that equipment. So if you calculate the cost of the equipment, look at the price of all of the required equipment to set up and do the samples that um, you're going to be analyzing in the, in the laboratory, and then look at the installation requirements and the training required to operate that instrument. Then look at the cost of your current methods, whether you're using a third-party laboratory, wet chemistry in-house, or an FPIR, or another near-infrared analyzer. Look at the number of samples that you're currently analyzing. Determine the cost per assay. You need to include chemicals, disposal costs of chemicals, labor, consumables, any periodic maintenance, calibration standards that you would have to buy to buy the calibration so that you know that they're predicting accurately. And then calculate that for what you do now and what you would do if there were little or no incremental cost to running more samples. And your return on investment calculation becomes pretty simple. Look at the cost of the instrument divided by the cost of the current methods, and that will give you the payback on your instrument in months. Now, one of the things that we've seen in dealing with various manufacturing processes <coughs> excuse me, is that sampling frequency is king. If you can sample more frequently, you will be able to identify small changes in your process and be able to correct for them before they start costing you money. Now, there's some indirect advantages that you'll get from implementing these types of measurement uh, paradigms. One of them is being able to detect uh, smaller uh, trends in the process and correct for them before you start losing the expensive components of your uh, ingredients, that being the fat and the protein, but also you'll be able to have an idea of what the overall efficiency and mass balance in the manufacturing situation is. So being able to test at a higher frequency is a decided advantage for being able to know what's going on in your process. So when we look at the cost of ownership of one of these systems, we'll divide it into two different areas. The spectrometer has three components that are going to be changed out over the lifetime of the instrument. Uh, the lamp is the near-infrared source in the instrument. It's priced at $367.20, has a general lifetime of 12 months, and you can replace it yourself. You do not need a service engineer to come on site to make that replacement. Likewise, for the internal laser, which is the reference standard for the wavelength accuracy in the instrument, has a lifetime of nominally 36 months, costs $1,700, and you can replace it yourself. Again, you do not need a service engineer to come on site. Finally, there's a desiccant in there to keep the moisture level inside the instrument constant. It's changed as required, and there's actually an indicator on the instrument that will tell you when you need to change it. And you can regenerate that in the oven. And the desiccant is just a standard 4A molecular sieve that you can buy from any of the laboratory supply houses and be able to uh, change that out yourself. When we look at the LSM module, 
one feature you'll notice is that the plastic tubing on the LSM module is all out front. So if there's any tubing that looks like it's starting to wear, crack, or uh, become otherwise unstable, you'll notice that immediately. And the replacement cost for the tube sets are shown here as well. Um, nominally, the frequency is 36 months for changing those things out. And actually, for all of them, it's based on the actual number of samples measured. And with the homogenizer valve, you only replace that once necessary. There's no firm periodic maintenance schedule because it really depends on the number of samples that you're running through the homogenizer. And again, if most of your samples don't require homogenization, it's very easy to bypass that using the peristaltic pump and extend that life. The cell, as I mentioned previously, is constructed from quartz. It has about an $800 price tag on it, and the only time you have to replace it is if it's broken. And I have yet to see anybody actually break a cell when it's installed in the instrument and operating uh, um, under normal operating procedures. So to recap, um, with the Simply One dairy system, the advantage is that you can measure all samples on one instrument. The performance on liquids is very similar to the FTIR measurements that people are familiar with with dairy samples. In fact, in many cases, the repeatability of the system is better than FTIR systems, particularly with fixed samples like the ice cream premixes, creams, eggnogs, chocolate milks, high solids materials. Um, you'll get a faster ROI in justifying the purchase of one of these systems because of the fact that you can do all of the samples on one system. So you can save money on reference lab costs or wet chemistry costs inside your uh, business by moving it all off to one system. And it has a smaller footprint because we're replacing two spectrometers in one that's a little bit smaller than some of the FTIRs on the market. You can save some laboratory space so things aren't quite as crowded. Cost of operation is very low. Um, generally, um, cost of operation is limited to the cleaning solutions that you would use, which is um, probably about $300 a year in total cost of cleaning solutions. And then finally, the rugged design means that the measurement precision and accuracy stay very, very consistent over the long period, eliminating the need for chasing biases with the instrument. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my colleague Ralph Hewitt to speak about in-process applications. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. As Dean said, uh, we're going to now transition into uh, in-process applications. Uh, in this discussion, we'll pivot a little bit from our premier uh, benchtop uh, or flagship instrument, the uh, Simply One system, to a broader discussion of in-process applications as well as at-line uh, platforms. So. As you can see from this slide, one of the things that we want to discuss is there are a number of different ways, number or a number of diff different measurement techniques that are appropriate in a process environment. Um, all of these, this will direct us and guide us to what types of probes we're going to use, um, what the best way to measure those samples are. So as you see here in transmission, uh, that being the way that we're measuring, where we're transmitting light through the sample and measuring or collecting that light on the other side of the sample. We do that for milk, whey, uh, RO, and UF samples, and uh, we do that, again, in real time uh, when we're talking about in-process applications. The other uh, primary uh, way that we measure is through reflectance mode. Uh, this is typically diffuse reflectance, and you'll see that where we're illuminating the sample and we're collecting the light that reflects back from the sample, the diffusely reflected light from the sample. In that, we would measure samples such as cream, uh, WPC, whey, and milk powder, uh, yogurts, puddings, ice cream, premix, cheese, sour cream, butter, and many, many other uh, types of samples in your application that, for instance, we wouldn't be able to transmit light through. So when we do this uh, measurement, we do it on a single spectrometer, uh, which is called a matrix F. The matrix F is unique in the industry in that it is uh, an FTNIR that has a six-channel multiplexer, which allows us to do full-spectrum FTNIR analyses on the bench 
as well as in the process. So when we look at the matrix F and uh, our FTNIR technology, we get significantly reduced vibration sensitivity with this platform. Our calibrations are easily transferable between both our benchtop analyzers and our process analyzers. And we have three models available. As you can see, transmission only, reflectance only, and reflectance and transmission in a single unit. Some of the other advantages that we see with the Matrix F is we're one of the only companies out there that can make the claim that we're measuring in process on the same technology that we're measuring in the lab. Now, how does that give you an advantage? Well, that gives you an advantage in the idea that your staff needs to only be trained on one software platform to develop calibration. You get to understand one technique rather than having to understand both the NIR and the IR techniques, as you'd see with many of our competitors, or, for instance, uh, having uh, multiple different sample preps that you'd have to do on a single uh, uh, benchtop analyzer. So for our diffuse reflectance measurements, we uh, recently, actually it was uh, mid-year last year, I believe, or, or early fall, we released our 3A certified reflectance probe, which is called the Q412 uh, slash AAH. Uh, this probe has the ability to, number one, have one of the largest sample illumination areas in the industry at, at almost uh, a little bit over one inch. Uh, it has a large depth of field, uh, one inch, so basically we can also penetrate uh, in reflected ma or materials that we're going to measure reflectance off of. We can penetrate up to about uh, an inch in, uh, in depth. We have internal referencing, which we can either do on demand or you can automate that process. Um, unlike many of the diode array technologies and things like that that are out on the market, we don't have to reference as frequently because our analyzers just don't drift. So the changes that we're seeing are usually uh, more associated with environmental changes, things like that, um, things that, that would have uh, a much, much lower impact on an FTNIR than they would on, on a similar technology uh, 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 based on other uh, types of near-infrared. The other uh, aspect of the Q412 that, that's important to, to note is for CIP conditions, we have sapphire optics. Uh, they're very, very uh, tolerant to extreme uh, conditions. Uh, we have the ability to attach the Q412AH to uh, both barren line uh, pipe sections, which are commonly used in the dairy industry for analyzers for uh, more than 10 or 15 years now, as well as weld-in flange adapters, uh, which are, uh, are uh, presenting some options for different mounting uh, positions inside of the uh, inside of your plant. The Q412 uses a single fiber rather than the dual fibers that we use with, uh, for instance, transmission probes. We use a single fiber connection uh, to the matrix F. Uh, the sample illumination actually happens in the Q412 itself, so we aren't sending illumination or light from the analyzer out to the probe. So we have a lot of light out at the point uh, that we're connected to your process. And we have a system where with the Q412, it can be attached with a uh, triclover clamp, which makes it easily removable uh, for servicing without having to interrupt the process. Um, as you can note here, you see this small uh, standoff between the Varen line pipe section and the Q412. The standoff has its own sapphire window, so we're able to disconnect while leaving your process intact. So again, not, not having to impact whether or not your your uh, production is down when you when you uh, have to remove the instrument or you decide to uh, plan your servicing. So if you notice with the Q412 in, in this slide, we also, I was talking about the weld-in flange that we have. We also have a flexible coupling that we use. So where this one is mounted at is actually on the sifter, the vibratory sifter, just after a fluid bed dryer on a milk powder. Uh, uh, production line. Now, as many of you uh, probably have seen on, on those types of sifters, these are very, very high uh, uh, movement type of uh, positions where you would just shake a uh, analyzer to death if you tried to mount one on there. So by us illuminating through a sapphire window and having the Q412 where it's detached from the process with this flexible coupling, we're able to analyze all the time with very, very little impact uh, and in all likelihood, no impact to the Q412 from a uh, performance or maintenance perspective. 
and know where over time. So looking also ahead to things like butter production, uh, you saw the barren line pipes. That's where in most butter production uh, you would be at. But you can also mount the Q412, as you see in this, uh, in this picture, where we're eliminating any free-flowing uh, uh, butter in your production, whether it's going into your uh, 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 bin or, or wherever you might be uh, putting that. So you get a lot of flexibility in the places that you can mount the Q412. The Q412 is also used as, as shown here in high solids and liquids uh, slurry measurements. Uh, you can see here where, again, we're on a barren line uh, pipe section. Uh, but in this particular application, we are measuring a highly viscous material. Again, that highly viscous material gives us a nice diffuse reflectance uh, signature that we're able to uh, bring back to the, to the analyzer or to the spectrometer and uh, give you very, very high quality measurements over time. Also, I should mention in, in these types of applications, we also, if, if you're very close to a pump or uh, a motor of some, some kind, and you worry that, that perhaps you're going to transmit vibration into the uh, Q412. We also have a flexible uh, coupling that we can put on a barren line pipe as well that can isolate the Q412 from any of those intense vibrations uh, to help reduce, uh, again, wear over time. So pivoting now from the uh, Q412 and, and our ability to measure and reflectance, I want to talk a little bit about our transmission probes. So you uh, probably have seen some of the advertisements in the last year of the uh, Helma 3A certified transmission probe. This is a transmission probe with a one millimeter uh, path length. It allows us to measure milk, whey, RO skim, UF skim, and condensed skim milk. Um, just like with our Q412, it uses sapphire optics. These are compatible, again, with caustic uh, and acidic DIP processes. And in this particular application, we're using a two-inch triclover fitting with an immersion depth suitable for installation in two-inch through eight-inch uh, pipes. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in, in where you're going to mount that, that system. This probe uh, came out, oh, it was early last year, uh, probably right around the uh, time of PitCon. And again, it is one of the first probes that are out there and available to you that is 3A certified and is, is able to be used through uh, an FTNIR platform. Looking at the way that we installed the uh, Helma 3A probe, you can see that this probe is installed directly in the pipe uh, through a flange fitting. Again, that's a triclover flange. In this particular uh, example, you can see that milk just flows through there. But Something that, that is very important to mention here, and this is very similar to what Dean talked about with the Simply One analyzer. Because we're using FTNIR, we have this ability to measure much, much large, longer path lengths. And when you see this, look at the very large gap spacing that you have there for the milk to flow through. So if you're talking about raw milk, which has large fat globules, and, you're, and or you're talking about uh, any high solid stream uh, or higher solid stream, you're talking about a system where, because of this large gap that we have, the, the likelihood of it plugging up is much, much diminished from what you'd see on, say, an FTIR with a very short path length. Um, this system is, is capable of, of uh, producing high-quality results that will mimic almost exactly what you're getting as far as performance on our benchtop analyzer. So the next thing I want to discuss a little bit about, and we'll just touch on this briefly, is that Bruker also is unique in the fact that we can also offer a high-quality FTNIR at-line uh, model called the Tango that can be used for measuring, uh, for instance, sour cream, uh, cheeses, uh, milk powders, things like that. But the, again, the, the thing that's, that's really unique about the Bruker solution is this benchtop system runs on the same FTNIR platform, same, same, uh, um, uh, the same detectors that you would see in our benchtop system or our process system. And again, we're doing this uh, where you can uh, migrate your calibrations from one platform to the next and backwards and forwards as you need. So the Tango has been out for a number of years now, I think uh, four years, 
And it's a compact single channel FTNIR, unlike our Simply One system, which has multiple channels, uh, both transmission and reflectance. Uh, the Tango is a single ch channel system, which can be purchased in either reflectance or in transmission mode. Uh, it has uh, a nice touchscreen, uh, intuitive touch panel uh, interface, which allows you to define top level product groups and individual product products within those groups. It has the lowest cost of ownership of any FT uh, instrument out there. In fact, uh, Dean talked a little bit about the replacement of, of the laser that we would have in our Simply One system. In the Tango, we actually have a diode, uh, a diode laser, which means that we realistically will probably never have to change that, uh, that laser during the lifetime of that, that instrument. And then the other thing, again, I'll just mention it one last time, direct calibration transfer from the MPA is possible and is done every day by, in hundreds of locations around the world uh, by our, uh, our uh, large portfolio of customers. So now we will just recap this, and I'll turn this back over to Dean to uh, allow him to uh, complete the, uh, the recap, and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Ralph. Just kind of to recap here, um, the MPA Simply One FTNIR, composed of the liquid sampling module and the MPA spectrometer, has pretty simple benefits for dairy processing. Single instrument, one platform for software, so you only have to teach your operators how to use one software package, and it measures all samples. Um, we are working diligently to eliminate aftermarket costs for supporting the instrument in terms of service engineers and making as much of the maintenance of the equipment user maintainable as possible, including the lamp, tubing in the uh, uh, LSM, homogenizers, flow cell, reference laser, all of the different things that we know are going to have to be changed over the lifetime of the instrument. The MPA has permanently aligned optics. We haul these things around the country in the back of cars, set them up, and just start running samples, and they just work. Um, from a process analyzer standpoint, we use the same technology in our process analyzers that we use in the benchtop instruments. The uh, sample presentation methods mimic the benchtop methods, so in many cases, you can transfer calibrations from a benchtop instrument to a process instrument, and just with some slight tweaks to uh, uh, make it uh, compatible with moving samples, you can use those calibrations, which gives you faster startup. And then finally, uh, calibration transfer between instruments is a standard thing that we've been doing for years. Uh, we've got calibration solutions not only for the dairy industry, but for fats and oils, animal feed productions, and the idea is that every instrument is a master, and it really allows us to just put the calibrations on, and you're ready to roll. The Tango is a nice platform for at-line um, analysis of samples where you have operators that are not trained laboratory technicians where they can just walk up, touch the icon for the product that they need to analyze, put the sample on it, and get the answer to verify that the process is in fact. And with that, I think we're ready to take any questions that you may have. Thanks, Dean and Ralph, for a great presentation. And now we'll have our presenters address a few questions that have been submitted throughout the program. First, could you please summarize what kind of information can I get from the instrument? Is it composition? Yes, it is composition. Uh, so for fluid milk samples, we would typically analyze for protein, fat, total solids, lactose, solids, non-fat. Uh, we've also got calibrations to look at true protein versus total protein. In raw milk, we can look at casein, and we've also got calibrations for milk urea nitrogen and freezing point depression. When we're looking at solids, um, total solids, the uh, protein, the fat, uh, sugar compositions, and those sorts of things are typical parameters that one would look at. For milk powders, whey powders, and so on, it's also the compositional typical analysis uh, for the, the protein, lactose, moisture, and so forth. Are there different calibrations for different milk sources? 
we haven't started working on calibrations for goat milk or any of the other uh, uh, types of milks, which we're really kind of uh, focusing on uh, cow milk right now. But what we're finding is that with the cow milk, we can combine samples from all over the world, different species that have different uh, uh, protein levels or fat levels. And by combining those into a single calibration, we get a much more robust calibration for looking at the compositional analysis of the milk. There's no reason to think that you couldn't do calibrations for goat's milk or um, buffalo milk or any of the other types of uh, uh, commercially available products that are out there. We just haven't done those yet. We are open to developing those if somebody would like to work with us on that. What is the true cost of ownership for your lab dairy system? It's pretty much what you saw in the uh, slide. If I can go back to uh, that uh, slide here, if I can find it. There we go. Um, it's pretty much right here. The um, cost of ownership, you're going to change the lamp, the laser, over the course of the instrument uh, life, uh, the tubes and the uh, homogenizer valve, and you know, if you get a little bit ham-handed with the cell, um, and you see the prices right there. We would normally recommend a PM visit on the instrument once every three years, and a PM visit is $3,900. Great. Um, what is the limit of detection on the different milk components? Fat is probably the easiest one to answer there because skim milk uh, generally has near zero fat. And the calibration actually goes down to 0.01% fat. Uh, we very seldom ever see uh, low detection applications for protein. Um, except maybe in um, wave streams where we're looking at the uh, permeate and trying to see how much protein came across the, the membrane. And in general there, the limit of detection is probably going to be around 0.05%. Excellent. Uh, this person came in late. Uh, what kind of ROI can, can they expect with the Simply One system? Well, it, it really depends on how many different samples you're running. The more samples, the more types of samples you run, the faster your ROI is going to be. Um, and then how fast uh, you achieve that depends on the number of samples that you're currently running and the number of sample types that uh, you're going to be using on the instrument. Um, we've done some ROI calculations for customers where they'll pay for it in as little as two months. Great. So how often do you have to bias calibrations? You don't bias calibrations. Um, there is no drift in the spectrometer because of the laser for the wavelength accuracy and the fact that we're using the quartz cell. Um, now, it is good analytical practice to check and verify, but the frequency with which you do that is really uh, much, much lower than you would have to do with other instruments because of the fact that you don't have a cell that wears and you have very low resistance to, full, to the flow because we have a large path length and large diameter tubing. So really, calibration should not have to be biased. All right. Uh, what kinds of samples do you have to homogenize and what don't you have to homogenize? And if you don't have to homogenize, why do you offer a homo homogenizer? Good question. Um, the only samples that you really need to homogenize are raw milk samples or samples that are derived directly from raw milk. So that could be vat milk and cheese production or um, milk prior to going through a homogenizer pasteurizer system in a, in a bottling plant. Any other samples you can run without homogenizing. In fact, the LSM is offered in a model that eliminates the homogenizer and just uses the peristaltic pump. So the two critical components of the uh, liquid sampling mod module uh, would be for temperature stabilization of the sample, which is critical to gaining accuracy and repeatability in the calibrations. And the um, 
liquid sampling module without the homogenizer costs a little bit less than the one with. So you can buy it with or without depending on what your applications are. So this person asks, is there any way to use it to track food aging or spoilage, like rancidity, vitamin content, et cetera? Not for vitamin content. Typically, those are too low to be able to quantitate uh, with any kind of accuracy. In terms of the, uh, the rancidity, that uh, is an application that we typically use in edible oil analysis to look at anisidine value and peroxide value, and those are um, um, indicative of the degradation of the fat sample. So that is something that you could look at um, with the near infrared. Um, we haven't done those calibrations for milk or for cheese samples, but uh, in principle, one could do that. Excellent. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the training people need to operate the system? We can have somebody up and running the instrument in about an hour. Um, very simple user interface where everything is defined as products. So you would select which product you want, and all of the calibrations and measurement parameters will be automated for that product. And there's a spreadsheet display that pops up that gives you the history of results that have been run for that product. And uh, it's really pretty straightforward, just a, a simple graphical user interface. Um, to teach somebody how to maintain the instrument, probably about a day. And that's, that's really about all you need. Great. Um, can, can this instrument be used to analyze stabilizers, emulsifiers, blends of gums, or mono and diglycerides? Mono and diglycerides are a major part of the edible oils analysis packages that we have. Um, we frequently sell instruments to companies that are taking triglycerides and uh, making mono and diglycerides out of them, and we can quantitate the amount of mono and diglycerides in the production process. And certainly, if you were looking at trying to determine the mono to diglyceride, the triglyceride ratios and products that you're bringing in, a calibration could be developed for that. Um, in terms of the gums, I believe there are applications there for the degree of hydration of the gums. Um, I'm not really well versed in, in those types of applications, but we would love to talk about it. Great. Do you have any case studies or application notes available for the Simply One? We've got application notes available. Um, we're hoping to release some case studies in the very near future. Uh, right now, customers that are using our systems, we have uh, non-disclosure agreements, so we can't release those just yet, but uh, we hope to be coming out with some case studies in the very near future. Excellent. So um, can you talk a little bit about the consumables needed for operation of the instrument? If you're doing solids, and you want to use polystyrene petri dishes to avoid the, um, the use of glass in a, in a food production environment, then um, it's just the cost of the polystyrene petri dishes. You can buy those from any of the laboratory supply houses and find the prices for those. They're 90 millimeter diameter petri dishes that are typically used. In terms of uh, consumables for the liquid analysis, it's really just the uh, detergent solutions that would go into the LSM. So, you know, probably three, four hundred dollars a year, depending on how many samples you're actually running. Maybe a little bit more than that uh, if you're a very high volume laboratory. But uh, typically, we use a five percent solution of the cleaning concentrate, and a, um, a bottle is one hundred and twenty-five dollars, which will uh, produce about thirty gallons, I think, of cleaning solution. So, not too bad. Excellent. Well, it looks like we've run through our questions from the attendees. Um, so this concludes today's webinar. So please join me in thanking presenters Dean Roberts and Ralph Hewitt, as well as our sponsor, Brooker. As you exit today's webinar, please take a couple minutes to complete our survey. We strongly welcome your detailed comments to help us serve you better. If you have any additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinars at bnpmedia.com. 
please web please visit webinars.dairyfoods.com for the archive of this presentation as well as information about our upcoming events. We appreciate your time and hope you have found this webinar to be a valuable experience. 